chapter 12. So please turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 12. Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith that God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace of given to each of us. If it's serving, then serve. If it's teaching, then teach. If it's to encourage, then give encouragement. If it's giving, then give generously. If it's to lead, do it diligently. If it's to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Some things just go better together. Is this not true? A few examples. Crackers and cheese. They just go better together. Or hamburgers and fries, or pancakes and syrup, or better yet, Oreos and milk. How about that? How's a hot dog without a bun? And what's bread without butter? And what is pie without ice cream? Spaghetti without meatballs. They're just better together. Chips and salsa. Chips are just horrible. They don't have salsa in it. <laughs> Eggs, bacon. Or, I'm all around that track. How about some toast, some bacon, some lettuce, and tomato? Ah, good BLT. Especially when those tomatoes are fresh. Oh, so good. Better together. Ice cream. I know. I, I, you're getting hungry. The good, the good news this morning is we have food, and so it won't be long until we eat it. Ice cream and the cone, you know, salt and pepper. You can just go on and on. There's just all kinds of these things that you put them together, and it's just better than they would be all by themselves. And you know, I grew up thinking about these things that go together, and I was thinking about how about green eggs and ham? Maybe not. But some things maybe don't belong together, and I just saw this cartoon actually. I do not like green prunes and bran. I do not like them Sam, I am. The later years. <laughs> Some things just don't belong together very well. Now when it comes to spiritual, what we've been talking about these last couple weeks, that we find rest in our relationship with Christ. When we employ these spiritual disciplines, these wonderful things that Help us to experience the grace of God in greater measure and to grow because grace trains us in obedience and walking in to say no to sin and to do the things that we're called to do. Titus 2, as we have looked at numerous times. We find that Jesus calls us to find rest in taking up the yoke, which is a yoke of discipline by which we learn to walk with Him each step of the way. Most of them are probably solitary disciplines. They're things we do by ourselves like prayer, or reading the scripture, or finding a quiet place out in the woods someplace, or taking a retreat. I mean, there's all kinds of these spiritual disciplines which call us to just be by ourselves with just us and the Lord. But there's some that are better when we do them together. And those are the ones we want to look at this morning. We can't look at all of them in a one-month series. I just kind of pick and choose a a few of these spiritual disciplines. We'll, we'll come back to them from time to time because there's some other wonderful ones that God can use in our life. <clears throat> but there are these solitary disciplines that we've talked about. But then there's these disciplines that we do better together. Like worship. We can have a great time of worship all by ourselves. 
Some of us, God has given a voice or the ability to play an instrument, and, and we can all by ourselves have a great time. Or, or you could go out in the woods and, and enjoy the beauty of God's creation, and your heart can be filled with praise, and, and that happens. We have those personal times of worship where we're just awestruck in the glory and the wonder of God. But there's something so much better when we get the instruments together, and we get the singers up front, and we get everybody, and when we pack the house, it's better than it could ever be by ourselves. Worship is one of those spiritual disciplines that's better together. Um, fellowship. How are you going to have a dis how, how is it going to happen by yourself? It doesn't happen by itself. You can't do it by yourself. You need other people. Serving other people. It requires somebody else in the mix. You can't do it all by yourself. It's just not the way it works. There's some that can be either, like prayer. Because we can pray together, and that's very powerful. Or we can pray by ourselves. Um, fasting is another one. Sometimes a whole group of people will fast at the same time. Other but most of the time it's an individual discipline that God brings and uses in our lives. But these disciplines of community, these things like fellowship and worship and service and things along this line, keep us from becoming unbalanced. Most of us are not called to a monastery someplace. I always think of those desert fathers, some of those desert fathers, the, the guys that built the towers out in the desert and then they s stayed up there for years and years. <laughs> Most of us are not called to that kind of an existence. Okay? That's kind of an extreme. And sometimes we, we might think that, you know, if I spend my whole day in prayer, I do this. Well, these community disciplines kind of bring us back to reality and help us to root what we're doing in everyday life. <clears throat> because that's really what it's all about. Discipleship, learning to take on the yoke, is about how, how do we live this life in, in the everyday, especially when things are difficult for us. How do we live our life in the yoke with Jesus when we're dealing with things in our marriage or our family or things go wrong with our health? or somebody in our family? How do we deal, how do we walk when in the everyday stuff of life? And the wonderful part is not, not only do we put the yoke on that yokes us to Jesus, who carries the weight, but he also gives us each other. And we, the body of Christ, become those who come around and help us when we're going through the tough times. We rejoice with those that are rejoicing. We weep with those who are weeping. We utilize the gifts that God has given us. And by, do, by so doing, we strengthen each other. We lift each other up. We encourage each other. And we help each other along that narrow path that Jesus takes us. So these disciplines of community keep us from becoming unbalanced. They root our spiritual lives in everyday reality. They enable us to find our way in the tough stuff of life. I just want to mention briefly a couple of these. The most obvious one is fellowship, where we grow through our life together. Um, Jesus, I told you that Jesus did these things, right? Um, and it's true. Um, Jesus, from eternity past, has always had fellowship. God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have lived in fellowship and they always will live in fellowship with one another. The very nature of their being and existence is that there's an eternal fellowship that's going on. But even when Jesus was incarnate in human flesh and he came and he walked as a man, who was he spending time with? There was a group of 12 that he called to spend time with him, to go with him everywhere he went, pretty much. Now, occasionally he'd go off on sol into solitary places or go up the mountain or he'd decide to send them out on the boat and then he'd come walking on the water and scare them. But there were, most of the time, most of the time he was with these, this group of 12 people. He had this deep earthly fellowship with them. And then there was the inner circle. Like when he went to pray, sometimes he let Peter, James, and John come along. Or when the transfiguration took place, when he was, they were being shown his glory. There was just the inner circle who were able to be a part of that. And so it is in our lives. There are, there are some spiritual friendships that we have that are closer than others. There's going to be some people that we relate to on a deeper level than other people. We can't really relate to everybody at a deep level. We just aren't equipped to do it. We're human beings. 
and we're not able to do that. But we can have a few really close spiritual friends who come alongside us and encourage us and help us along the way especially. And then there should be a group of others that we significant, have significant relationship with. And then there will be others where we know who they are and we, we, we greet them, and we, but they aren't so much a part of our life on a regular basis. And uh, you have a lot of those on Sunday morning. You might know who they are. You might say hi to them. You might not know what their name is. <laughs> Sometimes people forget. But, but you have a relationship with them to some degree. Maybe not a deep one, but you have some relationship. What is fellowship? At its heart, fellowship is sharing at a deep level. It's more than coffee and sitting around talking about baseball and the weather. Now, sometimes small talk will get you there. You know, there's a, it's okay to have some small talk. But you want to get deeper than that. You want to be able to share, to, to be more vulnerable and to share what's going on in your heart. What's going on in your life, in the everyday reality. Because as you pour that stuff out and as you, you share that with others, then there's the opportunity for deep ministry to take place with each other. It's one of the reasons we have small group ministries here. It happens in other places too, but the small groups become especially a place where we share what's going on in our lives so we can pray for each other and care for each other. And that's really what fellowship is. In the early church, fellowship was such an important part of what was going on. In Acts chapter 2, right after Pentecost, as the church is just being formed, we get this picture of the church as it begins. And he says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. And to fellowship. It keeps going. To the breaking of bread, to prayer. And everyone was filled with awe at the signs and the wonders that were performed by the apostles. And then all the believers were together and they had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. And every day, not just once a week, but every day, they continued to meet together in the temple courts and they broke bread in their homes, and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. It's an extraordinary fellowship that's taking place here, where daily they were going back to the temple courts, and they were worshiping there, and they were taking place, there's fellowship happening there. But it also says that they were going into their homes, and with glad and sincere hearts, they were eating together and fellowshipping together. There was deep fellowship that was taking place on various levels. The picture we get of the early church is that they were very involved with each other's life all week long. It wasn't just, we come to church and we sit and listen to a sermon for a Sunday. It was much deeper than that. It was a real caring for each other, getting to know each other, where we got into each other's homes and we spent time with, enough with each other to really get to know what's going on in our lives. Where we can let down our masks and our pretending and just be real. So that we can really minister to each other. And that is not always what the church has been. And it's certainly what it should be. Um, you see, each, as Romans tells us, each of us is part of a body. With many members, and all those members don't have the same function. So in Christ, we, though many, form one body. <coughs> And each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to us. God has gifted you. He's given you spiritual gifts that are to be used to help encourage and help other people through their troubles, in part. And also to reach out to this community. Um, and that happens when real fellowship takes place. When we talk at a deep level. When we find out and we, we know what's going on in each other's lives. And we're able to care for, encourage, teach, admonish, pray for one another. See, fellowship is all about the one another's of Scripture. At the heart of it is love. Love one another. That's the one that's mentioned the most. And it's not just love like I love chocolate cake. It's not desire. It's willing the good for the other person. It's a much deeper kind of love than just I love chocolate cake. Because you know what you want to do with chocolate cake. I'm going to make you hungry yet. You want to eat it, right? <laughs> And that's not love. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Hebrews 11.24 says, Let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some of you are in the habit of doing. But encourage one another, and all the more, 
as you see the day approaching. Don't give up meeting together. And even back then, there were some who had a bad habit, it says, as some of you are in the habit of doing. You know. um, we sometimes think the early church didn't have any problems, and that's not true. The early church had the same problems we do for the most part. But God was moving in them in a powerful way, and things were happening there because of the Spirit of God. But they were still people that were messed up, just like we are, um, and consequently they had their problems too. That's why Paul wrote so many letters. If the, if the churches were doing just fine, he wouldn't have had anything to write about. Um, but that wasn't what was going on. One of the things that we do in fellowship is we spur one another on to love and good deeds. And that, my dad loves John Wayne movies. He always has. He's got everyone that could ever... He's got every, he has them on video, you know, the old VHS, and then he's got them on DVD, and I don't even know. He might have them. He's got all of them. I mean, literally. And... Um, so when I think about spurs, I always think about John Wayne. <laughs> Spurring is a kind of encouragement um, that isn't always pleasant. Is it? Um, it is an encouragement, let me tell you, but it's not exactly the most fun kind of encouragement. That, and, and this is what happens in fellowship. Um, as we teach and admonish one another, as we love one another, as we forbear with one another, as we are patient with one another, as we care for one another, as we pray for one another, as we share with one another, sometimes we bump up against each other. And, and sometimes that's a hard thing. Sometimes some of us have sharper elbows than others, and some of us have louder voices than others. <laughs> some of us are more assertive about these things than others. But in any case, what we find is, despite our best intentions, what happens in the church is that sometimes the sharp elbows get us. And what should we do in those times? Well, we shouldn't give up. We should not give up. We should recognize that this is a part of a, a trial of my faith that's going to help me to grow. Sharp elbows help you to grow just as much as trials do. It, it's not fun, but it's true. It's true. And you're going to find, if you're in a church long enough, you're going to find sharp elbows. Right? <laughs> you're going to hear people say things they maybe shouldn't do. Sometimes we think that sin against one another is one of the one another's, and it ain't there. It's not there. Um, but it happens. I was reading a book this week. It says, as Christians, we're kind of like, you know, going to the clearance section, and everything has an as-is tag. And <laughs> that's pretty good. You know, we're, we're moving ahead. We don't want to stay there. But we are all in process. And we're all learning... Hopefully we're disciples that are growing in our faith and looking toward and becoming mature in our faith. But along the way, there's a lot of stumbles. Just read the Gospels. Read those disciples. Um, I always loved Laurel and Hardy and you know the, the old slapstick humor. To me, the, the disciples are a lot of times just like that. They... <laughs> They don't get it at first, and neither do we. It takes us time and energy, but don't give up on fellowship. Sometimes you get spurs. Sometimes you get elbowed. But in any case, what we should be doing is trying to really be concerned about each other and share with one another. Take down the masks and share deeply with one another, because that's what fellowship really is. It isn't always easy. I guess I already said this pretty much. But fellowship is interaction between broken and vulnerable people. That's when it really happens. When we're willing to share. It doesn't ever, or rarely, I think it doesn't ever happen, among those who have it all together. If you put up a mask and pretend that you got it all put together, you will not have fellowship. You will have, guess what? You know what the word hypocrisy, back in the Greek, it really meant to put on a mask. It was to, to be play actor in the Greek dramas. That's where the word hypocrisy, that's what it comes from, is this idea of you put a mask on the front and you pretend to be somebody that you're not. That's hypocrisy. Um, and yet the church so often promotes that. I've been in many churches where it was almost like it was the what was expected of you. It was not okay to not be okay. 
You know what I'm saying? Um, I saw this, and I'll just share it briefly with it. This came out of a book called Emotionally, Emotionally Balanced Jerk, or something like that. Pretty good little book. Um, talks about the difference between proud and defensive churches and broken and vulnerable churches. Fellowship takes place as in best in the broken and vulnerable people, not in the proud, defensive people. In the proud and defensive church, we're guarded and protective about our imperfections and our flaws. We focus on the positive, strong, successful parts of our lives. And we're highly offendable and defensive. When we're broken and vulnerable, we're transparent and weak, and we're able to disclose ourselves when appropriate to appropriate others. Now, there's sometimes when it's not appropriate, and when the person that you're with is not safe. We get that. But when you're in a safe place, you're able to disclose. I'm aware of the weak, the needy, the limited parts of who I am, and I freely admit failures. I'm approachable and open to input. The problem defensive, I naturally focus first on the flaws, mistakes, and sins of other people. I give my opinion a lot, even when I'm not asked, and I don't get close to people. But the broken and vulnerable church is where we're aware of our own brokenness, and we have compassion, and we're slow to judge other people. We're slow to speak, and quick to listen, slow to become angry, as James taught us. I'm open, I'm soft, I'm curious about others. The proud and defensive, I keep people from seeing what's inside me. I like to control everything. I have to be right in order to feel strong and good, but the broken, vulnerable place is where I can delight in showing vulnerability and weakness, to quote Paul, that Christ's power may be seen in me. I can let go and give people an opportunity to earn my trust. I can understand that God's strength reveals itself <laughs> when I do sometimes admit my mistakes, weaknesses, and say, and can say, I was wrong. I'm wrong. Proud and defensive, I blame others, I hold grudges, I rarely ask for forgiveness. When I'm offended, I write people off. Broken and vulnerable, I take responsibility for myself. I speak mostly in the I and not the you or the they. I do not hold. I don't hold people in debt to me, and I am able to ask for others for forgiveness as needed. When I'm offended, I ask what questions to explore so that I find out what really happened. I don't give up on people. There's too many people that have given up on the church because of sharp elbows. Don't do that. But don't use the sharp elbows <laughs> when you don't have to. Okay. Um, I deny, avoid, or withdraw from painful realities when I'm proud and defensive. I give answers and explanations to those in pain. I try to fix them. I try to change them. But I, I'm like Job's miserable comforters. I have all the answers about why you're suffering. And here's what you need to do. The ten easy steps. Doesn't work. I have to prove I'm right when I'm wrong. Broken and vulnerable, I honestly look at the truth underneath the surface, even when it hurts me. I'm present with people in their pain. I don't have the answers, but I'm present with them. And I'm comfortable with mystery. I'm comfortable with saying, sometimes I don't know. I don't have the answer. Instead of getting wrong, I let things go. One last one. Proud and defensive, I'm demanding. I'm self-conscious, concerned about how others perceive me. I see people as resources to be used for God. And the broken, vulnerable churches where we assert I'm, I'm able to assert myself respectfully and kindly. I'm more aware of God and others than the impression that I'm making. I see people as gifts to be loved and enjoyed. We could go in and look at all the scriptural principles behind all those things, but the point is that when we come to fellowship with our guard up, with our masks up, trying to pretend what, that we're something that we're not, we won't go deep. And if you study what happens in small groups, you find the first few weeks... There's not much sharing that really takes place. Because you just have to get, you have to trust each other first. It takes time where you can let down your guard and trust other people, doesn't it? But one of the most beautiful things in the world is when you can find a group of people where you can be yourself and you can share your heart. 
And you know that you're not going to be judged for who you are or what you're doing, but you're going to be having people who just want God's best in your life, that want to love you with the kind of love that Jesus has, and who want to pray for you, and are willing to forgive you when you're wrong, and who are just broken enough to know that we're all um, in need of a deeper friendship, a fellowship with each other. You see, we're supporting ligaments of each other. That's what Ephesians tells us. And you think about it, you know, if you don't have the ligaments, what happens to your body? It's not very useful. It starts falling apart. It doesn't, how, how are the muscles going to operate? you got to have the supporting ligaments there. And that's what Paul says we are in the body of Christ. We're there to support each other and to hold the body together. And when we're not doing our part, it's not going to happen. Um, J.I. Packer said, We should not think of fellowship with other Christians as a spiritual luxury, an optional addition to the exercises of private devotion. We should recognize, rather, that such fellowship is a spiritual necessity. For God has made us in such a way that our fellowship with himself is fed by our fellowship with fellow Christians and requires to be so fed constantly for its own deepening and enrichment. Your spiritual walk, your personal walk with God, he says, isn't enough. It has to be amplified by relationship with other people. You see, it's in living out the truth in daily life that a lot of those tests of faith are found. It's when the grace of God comes and teaches us to say no to our own sinful desires. Living in relationship with others is a very important thing. Okay, so I'm just going to mention two others and then we'll be done. Then we're going to fellowship. <laughs> Another one is service. We grow by finding and using our gifts in service to others in the body and in the community. Jesus said, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. I am among you as one who serves, he says. He showed it in the foot washing, and he demonstrated it completely in the cross. And Jesus says, whoever wants to be first must be last of all and be servant of all. One very powerful spiritual discipline is seeing a need and meeting the need. Seeing a need and meeting it. Living humbly enough to be able to see where other people are hurting and do something about it. It's within our means to do. Um, the other fascinating thing about that is we often, in doing so, find our spiritual gifts. There's all kinds of ways of looking at spiritual gifts and how to find them, but I love this little quote. In the New Testament, we don't find our gift through self-examination and introspection, and then find ways to express it. Instead, we love one another. We serve one another. We help one another. And in so doing, we see how God has equipped us to do so. Want to find out what your spiritual gift is? See a need. Meet the need. And sometimes you'll sense that God is working through you. He gave you an ability to do something that maybe wasn't natural for you to do. Um, you might be surprised sometimes how he moves and works on us as the spiritual gifts are expressed in service. Um, let's keep going. One other last one, and that's worship. <coughs> Jesus was a worshiper, and he calls us to be worshipers. He says the Father is seeking worshipers. Remember his interaction in John. Um, and um, he demonstrates it in his life. The church in its early days clearly did that. Worship, as you might remember, is the what? The active, awe-filled, adoring celebration of God, in which we respond to His glory by declaring His worth through praise for who He is and thanksgiving for what He's done and through obedience and service because of what He says in His Word. And remember, worship doesn't end when the service ends. You take the Word as it's been preached and you apply it to your life and you go live it out because that's the response Worship is, in essence, a response. Whether it's singing, or listening to the scripture, to the, but it really becomes worship when we begin to live it out in obedience to Christ. There is a balance between the personal and the corporate. And we need both. 
We, and very importantly, we need each other. Each of us carries our own load-taking responsibility. Galatians 6 talk, I wish I had time to do this, but brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. But watch yourselves, or you may be also tempted. Listen, carry each other's burdens, and in this way you'll fulfill the law of Christ. But if anyone thinks there's something when they're not, they deceive themselves, and each one should test their own actions. Then they can take pride in themselves alone without comparing themselves to someone else. For each one should carry their own load. Do you see that there's something funny going on there? You're supposed to carry each other's burdens and carry your own load. Now how do you work that out? You have to think about it a little bit. There's some things that you have to do. You're responsible for your attitude. And you're responsible for your own growth. But when you see somebody in need, you're also responsible to help them carry the burden. So there are things that we need to do and we're responsible for, but we also need each other. And we're supposed to be there for each other. And these corporate disciplines enable us to find that balance of our own personal time with God and then working that out into our own life. So each of us carries our own load, taking responsibility, right attitudes, we shouldn't be filled with pride, as it says here. We should be filled with love. Yet, we're to carry each other's burdens, helping each other through times of trial and temptation with the aim of restoring them gently in the matter of Jesus. In all of it, we're, lament, we're learning to take up the yoke, for he provides the grace and the strength needed. And he's the one who gives rest to our weary souls. When it comes to spiritual maturity, there are no superstars without people around them. Many superstars haven't won championships, but those who have had a great team around them. I always like Michael Jordan. Love the way he could fly in there and put that basketball in the hoop. But he had some great players around him and he had a great coach that kind of kept his head on straight. And there's a lot of people who were very talented and who have been drafted at higher numbers than he was, who were thought maybe they would be great superstars, and maybe they played that way, but they didn't play as a team, and they didn't win championships. It's the same way in our spiritual walk. You can't be a Lone Ranger. Um, you know, even the Lone Ranger had Tonto. <laughs> And a horse. <laughs> Silver. The horse. So, you know, he wasn't all by himself. And we can't be either. We need to, we need to prioritize our spiritual lives, our, our walk with God, our, our time in the Word and our time in prayer. We need that so desperately if we're going to grow. But we need each other, too, when we're going through the tough times, especially. And some of you are going through tough times right now. And you know how much you need your brothers and sisters to seriously care and love and pray and not just to say it but to follow through on it. We all have this deep need for connection to one another and for a deeper connection that will help us to grow in our relationship with God. There's a definite connection between our fellowship with each other and our fellowship with God. Read 1 John and you'll see that to be true. We're better together. I was thinking about the yoke. Jesus says we put on the yoke and there's rest that's found in the yoke. But get this. There's not just me and Jesus in the yoke. We're like a team of horses all tied up together. Jesus is up there at the front. He's leading the way and he's providing the bulk of the strength. But he also gives us each other. We're also tied in together to those, especially those closest to us. And they're there to help us move ahead and go through the tough times as well. Jesus is there, and he says to us in closing, Come to me, all you who are weary, <clears throat> burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me.
for I am gentle, I am humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Let's pray. Lord, um, Lord, you want us to grow in our relationship with you so that we become those people who've grown in maturity and more and more into the likeness of Jesus. Keep us moving on the path, Lord. Come alongside us. Help us to put on these yokes that provide discipline in our lives, that, that root out the selfishness and root out the old self-life in us. And, and enable us, Lord, to walk in your strength and your power as you come alongside of us. And by your grace, you teach us to say no to sin. And you make us zealous to do what is good. Teach us how to do that in our personal lives. May we carry our own load in making sure that we take responsibility for that. But also, Lord, let us bear, help each other bear the load. Because that's why we're here. We are supporting ligaments. And we're gifted so that, not so that we look impressive, but so that we can help each other. So, uh, Lord, if there have been those who have been hurt by pointy elbows, may they find the ability to move beyond that and forgive and not give up. But let us <coughs> encourage each other and all the more as we see the day approaching. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to go to the Lord's table for in these next moments. And I just want to maybe just take a moment of quietness as the elders come to serve um, and prepare your heart for this time as we come into his presence um, and remember his death on the cross for us. Let's just take a moment of quietness. The night he was betrayed, Jesus took bread, and after he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my